um, normal echo. Uh, palpitations, maybe she had longer time, but uh, in the records you mentioned six months. Let's uh, look at this ECG to begin with. You know, it's a little interesting because it is not so straightforward as to consider the VT. This, I would call it as an irregularly irregular, white complex tachycardia. In the absence of the P waves, it, it clearly, uh, the first choice is going to be an atrial fibrillation uh, with the left bundle branch block, maybe not a typical left bundle branch block, even though the QRS complexes are very crisp and there is an associated left bundle, uh, leftward axis with a QS pattern in AVR. Looks like it's a bundle branch uh, block aberrancy during atrial fibrillation. This is how I read first. And, uh, you know, uh, this is the COVID era when the registrar tells me that this is the patient who has come with the recurrent palpitations. And if this ECG, uh, you know, if I read this as an atrial fibrillation with left bundle branch block, um, and then the, my first reaction would be like any other COVID patient, all right, pa, you just uh, uh, manage medically and send. But, but the smart registrar said, hold on, sir, this doesn't seem to be an atrial fibrillation with left bundle branch block. Uh, I said, why? Um, he showed me this, um, this ECG. Um, well, uh, then I still asked him, why, you, why don't you think? Then he could point out a few things. Maybe there are P waves. Maybe. Um, I was not convinced. But then this settled the issue. And what is this issue? Here, there are sinus beats, okay, T wave inversion, maybe uh, part of uh, that LBBB T wave memory, maybe. Uh, the T wave inversions are here, and um, the narrow QRS sinus beats are at least seen. And then whenever there is a white QRS coming up, typically that it is, it is uh, seeming to be not preceded by a P wave. Oh, I mean, it looks like it's a PVC. So this, appeared that, well, um, that particular wide complex irregularly irregular tachycardia in a normal heart patient could be a idiopathic ventricular tachycardia. And looking at the morphology, um, it is, it could be defined as a left bundle branch block, crisp QRS complexes, and the transition going all the way up to V6 with the leftward axis lead to almost like equiphasic here. This fits into kind of an idiopathic right ventricular inflow area or a moderator band or even anterior papillary muscle of the right ventricle origin tachycardia. So that was the kind of a clinical diagnosis that was made. And because it turned out to be idiopathic VT and not AF on the basis of this ECG, even in this COVID, we thought mm, we could take her for EPS and RFA. And before that, uh, it was done. Cardiac MRI, contrast enhanced, and then it turned out to be structurally normal heart, normal bioventricular function. There was nothing, no edema, no infiltration scar. And this is, uh, MRI is read by one of the finest of the LG cardiac MRI in the country, and we are very proud of him to have it to have him with us. In the EP lab, you continue to have uh, this runs irregularly irregular, a white QR sticky cardia, and you can see here a uh, lead to here is a little more positive than what you thought in the surface ECG. There it was more of a biphasic. It tells you something more, and that it, this, this change in the morphology, uh, not significantly, but definitely a perceivable uh, change in the morphology in a normal. Uh, can you people hear me? Vanita, can you hear me? Somebody had muted me. I can hear you, yes. Right, right. So um, uh, the interesting thing about uh, this irregularly irregular white QRS tachycardia for left bundle branch block morphology 
is changing from time to time, if not very grossly, very subtly, the morphology is changing. For example, here in lead to as compared to the, the, the previous ECG. And in fact, I had noticed few more changes in the inferior leads typically, but the left bundle branch block was a constant feature of this tachycardia. A normal heart, this kind of an irregularly irregular, uh, speaks about automaticity, speaks about uh, uh, late uh, uh, activity, not necessarily a scar related activity, but well, uh, there can be exceptions. So once we start, again, uh, uh, the HD grid catheter is, is the standard catheter for us to map. Um, so why I'm showing here the right bundle uh, potentials during the sinus rhythm here is that the moment I push the catheter a little more beyond this particular spot, I catch these PVCs and find that the activation little beyond the right bundle potential area seeing early activation recorded. And uh, here I think is about 25, but in that area, just, just beyond the right bundle potential area, uh, towards the apical region, anatomically, uh, fluoroscopically, uh, you catch these PVCs and then those areas, the early activity is inscribed. And at the same site, uh, among the uh, HD grade electrodes, wherever there was an earliest activation from the HD grade electrodes, um, bipole, if you pace, you get almost a similar pace map. It almost, uh, you know, is about 10 by 12 pace mapping. Interestingly, even if you bring a, a regular diagnostic catheter, in that area, you will see some sharp potentials at the onset of the QRS, and they precede the onset of the QRS during the sinus rhythm, as well as it appears these potentials give rise to this wide QRS as well during the PVC. And the unipolar signals there, if you blow that, signals, very sharp potentials during the sinus, very, very sharp potentials during the wide QRS ectopy, bipolar signals, and a very sharp negative QS complexes in the unipolar. So where was that wide QRS coming from? It appears, it appears that it could be from the conduction system, maybe Purkinje potential, because that was recorded both during the sinus rhythm as well as during the PVC. But the point was, if you look at the, the QRS morphology, it doesn't appear to be an endocardial morphology, what is a textbook description. It has an LBDB, leftward axis, uh, one and avial positive, the transition is towards the uh, towards the V5 or the V6. That is a textbook picture of an intracavitary structure named moderator grand. So, uh, so how how do you identify now that Purkinje that so-called potential is it really Purkinje arising from the conduction system? Whether it is endocardial, whether it is intracavitary structure, and whether that intracavity structure is an anterior papillary muscle or uh, the structure which is supported by another structure, uh, namely moderator band. And, and um, we have uh, limited resources. Uh, my eyes cardiologist, who is an uh, who is exceptionally talented uh, pediatric interventional cardiologist, uh, who uh, supports us with the eyes, he's not around. So now we do not have an eyes. And we do not know uh, the, uh, where this potential is coming from. Then we had our friend HD grid. 
I was thinking, how do we identify an intracavitary structure using the HD grid uh, mapping catheter without the eyes? It turned out this HD grid catheter is too very good. It can reliably identify an intracavitary structure. See, it cannot replace eyes, which I'm going to be showing you. But when it comes to the intracavitary structure, the definition could be made with the HD grid without the eyes. And how is that? Look at this uh, uh, live image. When you bring in the HD grid catheter, when you try to make a dense mapping and try to define the endocardial borders, you are making an endocardial border. And then when you come to a place, there it gets stuck. It would not budge. It would get stuck. Further attempts, further attempts, still it will push this back here. And then you will tend to have a void or a filling defect here. That means you are against a structure which is not making your spline to float all, all in the cavity and come towards the opposite wall. This is obstructing. When you have this kind of an impression that the shaft and the spline are not in the axis, the spline gets a bend, that means you are hitting an intracavitary structure, one. Second, you are unable to fill this gap. That means it is an internal structure or an intracavitary structure. Not only that, there is another thing which I thought we should use. And what is that? And that is known as a projection algorithm. Uh, it is a little too much for me to understand uh, and to explain to you people. Uh, but what, what it says, if you go by the projection algorithm, uh, the, the algorithm is such that if there are sharp potentials, whether during the sinus rhythm or during the tachycardia, the sharp potentials get ignored by the system if the system recognizes that this is away from the endocardial border. So it ignores, it, it ignores these points. And this, these points are not included in, in creating the map. Because you know this fact, you should now bear the truth by going into the system and check these, uh, these potentials, which the system has ignored to compute the shell. Second, the third, is what is the conventional wisdom. And what is that? You bring in the catheter. You bring in the catheter here, which is not recorded in the 3D imaging. A conventional catheter, if it is brought here, away from the shell, if it records sharp potentials, not a far field potential, number one. And here, if you, capture the tissue at say about one or two volts, but not a very high volt. That means you are hitting here at an internal structure. And hence, that particular area of interest is one of those papillary muscles or the moderator of that. So that is something to do with the projection algorithm. And during the, uh, so once you, you recognize that there could be a, an internal structure, you map in addition to the shell, you now concentrate on this area and you create another map uh, in addition to the shell. And th in this area, uh, there are at least four, uh, 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 four electrode couples, which would record quite an early signal during the ventricular a tachycardia or the PVC, which is about 30 to 35 milliseconds early. And if you, if you, if you look at the activation map, this is the area. And um, you bring uh, the ablation catheter. This is, this is a stationary image. 
this is the way this is where you you with the hd grid electrodes you had done the activation map you had done the pace map you bring the ablation catheter here another uh, point to tell that you are away from the endocardium is the way it it, it remains unstable in this area it, it cannot remain it cannot remain stable in this area that means you are actually touching an internal structure maybe a moderator band or maybe a, a anterior papillary muscle and uh, these are the sets of the lesions given in that area uh, this is the uh, LAO view look at the mobility and this is the LAO view now this is a standard moderator band area but well anterior papillary muscle still can be a possibility uh, this i'm putting it up because you are unable you are unable to hold the catheter uh, very occasionally at one spot maybe you are beyond 30 to 45 seconds and that is how uh, this is codified here the brown means more than 30 or 45 uh, seconds nowhere else you could you could fix uh, the 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 ablation catheter uh, that means it is not really stable that means it's not endocardial structure well uh, during that time uh, when you ablate there is this flurry typically a Purkinje originated um, pvcs there is a flurry of activity like this and then and after after few months you know how whatever the mark however much you give a burn or uh, don't uh, there is going to be a poisons and uh, uh, there was one more observation that was made um, uh, this was just beyond the right bundle branch potential so post rfa there was a period when i thought i really injured uh, the right bundle but after waiting i think about 30 minutes the bundle branch block resolved uh, so the summary here is i think it is most likely a moderator band the limitation of this case report that you know i don't have an ice but i used the hd grid um, the way the shaft and the spline uh, change their axis when i push and then uh, there was this conventional way of looking at the internal structure definition of uh, identifying larger amplitude uh, near field complexes and capturing the tissue at the low voltage and when we get into the algorithm of uh, near field far field of the 3d uh, all those things put together it definitely turned out to be an internal structure and uh, the the qrs morphology of the pvc is a textbook uh, finding of a moderator band and i thought it's a moderator band so so uh, it is possible with the hd grid you identifying an internal structure well it is not a replacement for ice uh, but i think uh, during the times like covid i think it's okay uh, you may still call that as moderator band or or a papillary muscle and make use of uh, the available tools and uh, and and uh, i think i ablated here this is the area i ablated uh, this is the area I ablated in the RO and the LAO I showed. Uh, this moderator band, uh, which carries the conduction system, and that is why there was a Purkinje potential. So I think, I think it was a moderator band VT, with whatever the limitations. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanju Saxena. Again, I feel so privileged that I presented these two cases to you. The excellent cases. The last one was um, is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, uh, you know, there have been episode of cases of idiopathic ventricular fibrillation triggered by ventricular premature beats in the region of the moderator band. Um, the so, so you know, you know, I guess I go back to the times when ice didn't exist. So. We used to do a lot of right ventriculography at, at one point in time. So one of the issues here is that the case reports that have been described uh, um, usually describe the origin at the 
distal end near the free wall of the of the of the right ventricle or in the body of the moderator band that is the site of these Purkinje potentials. Um, and there is an interesting hypothesis that uh, that the ventricular fibrillation is due to reentry in the uh, within the, between the moderator band and the free wall. So that's that's not new news. That's old news actually because. We've known for a long time that the moderator band is insulated from the free wall of the right ventricle, and uh, and there are excellent studies from Brian Hoffman and Bob Meyerberg and all showing the propagation independent of the adjoining wall. But there is um, there are uh, secondary tertiary branches that go into the wall. So where you are in relationship with this arborization. Um, you certainly seem to be a little higher up than the free wall from what you're showing. Uh, whether you are in one of the arborization networks attaching to the to the wall in the region uh, more proximal to the free wall, uh, you can't really say. Um, maybe if you get a chance sometime that in a future case that you do a, a you know a lateral a pure lateral RV gram. Uh, that may help define some of the margins if you don't have eyes. Right. right. That uh, you can do that at high That's, resolution. Uh, angiogram could have been done to further define. Yes, I take it. <laughs> so, but, but you know, it's only the lateral angio which is of value here, and uh, no, I and think you would have to. Yeah. Yes, true. Uh, and, and you would have to do it at high magnification just to see this area of the posterior aspect of. Uh, here, so on that angiogram, but um, and I think even you know the resolution with ice is also not the most terrific resolution. You have to really uh, from the right atrium, it's uh, you have to be really good to see the moderator band uh, and uh, putting ice in the right ventricle. We still have a lot to learn about that. So um, so there is a there's lots to be learned here. Uh, um, the hypothesis um, that has been put forward that there's re-entry between the band and the adjoining wall, um, it's a hypothesis, it's a decent hypothesis uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that can occur, but I think we have a lot to learn yet. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Saxena, for your comments. Uh, Ulas, uh, there are, I think, Fair number of publications from March Linsky group and some Chinese groups regarding this. Yes. And uh, they say that uh, probably you need to target both the septal aspect and the free wall aspect of the moderator band. So, uh, you know, with, without eyes, it's a little difficult to comment where you are and how much extent of the moderator band you are covering. So was the transthoracic echo or transesophageal echo something that would have helped you additionally other than HD grid or you thought that was adequate? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, better than nothing. Uh, you know, when there's no ice, you could have always uh, used uh, you know, T, but uh, the point here is patient needs to be uh, essentially anesthetized for that. So it will not be okay. You know, you can do a right ventricular endocardial map and uh, and then look at this projection view you're talking about related to that to get an idea. Uh, but, you know, these are really difficult things to do. We have a, we, it's not something that we do all the time. And uh, we have a lot to learn about what an electroanatomic map of the right ventricle uh, done completely would look like, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, you, I, I, as, as I, since I'm a fan of physiology, I would, and you have the ability now to do this. I mean, this is, <clears throat> this is contribution to our knowledge. Uh, we, you know, while we get these little areas where we ablate, seen in high density mapping, but we don't see the rest, rest of the chamber. And it would be important to know these things, and we don't know these things at this time. Even the 20 DCG of the tachycardia, the transition seemed to be at V4-5, which would probably put it at the place where you are ablating, the septal aspect of the moderator. Little, yeah, it's a little higher, you're quite right. And, uh, and the axis is a little less leftward than you would yes. see if you were more apical, you know. And so, 
so you're quite right. And somebody asked a question on the why is this not a, I think it is a paraceptal or parahisian uh, uh, arrhythmia. Uh, again, that comes, you know, it, it really comes down to doing those electroanatomic uh, relationships in these maps. Right, that's a uh, nice case, Alas. What are you showing us? You're showing us something? No, no, I will not show anything more. I think because um, it's time now. Uh, Dr. Anil Saxena, Dr. Vanita, uh, anybody has a comment? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, great cases, last. Saxena Saab, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful, really. I think uh, they were wonderful cases and uh, my special thanks to Dr. Sanjeev Saxena for adjusting his time and giving us time Absolutely. by adjusting his cases. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure having you here. Dr. Ulas, they were excellent cases. Thank you so much, Ajay. And uh, I think uh, today we wind it up in very good time. Yeah. In uh, absolutely one hour, we are out and about. Uh, next week, we are coming with a pot period of cases. It's going to be a pleasant surprise for all of you. So I think I, with the Dr. Saxena's permission, I close the meeting for today. Yeah, thanks.